I'm Aubrey Sitterson, and this is Scald. A Scald is, put simply, a Scandinavian or Icelandic bard. During the Viking Age and Middle Ages, they entertained their patrons, kings, jarls, a sort of nobility, with poetic tales of heroic deeds that were meant to be spoken and heard, not written and read. The Scald podcast is meant to help revive oral storytelling, a form of storytelling that's older than any other. Cavemen telling tales of the mammoth hunt, Homer singing about the Trojan War, and Scalds in the courts of their patrons. This is a form of storytelling with unique strengths and weaknesses that, over the course of the show, I'm looking forward to exploiting and avoiding, respectively. This is not an audiobook with stories meant for the page and then converted to spoken word, nor is it a radio play with sound effects and character actors. This is an ongoing, serialized fantasy narrative written specifically with your ears in mind, with my voice as the only instrument, the only method of delivery, and all done in a single, flawless take, just like a scald would have. This isn't me reading you a story. This is me telling you a story. This is Scald, part one. Maul stood before him, struggling to keep his courage in the presence of that smile, that baring of teeth, that rictus grin, that smile. Breathless from his labors and his sprint through the forest, Maul stood in the clearing, his bare feet digging into the dark soil, his toes subconsciously reaching down, desperate for the contact with the earth that he had been denied for the past decade. Hanging from the world tree with the sickeningly sweet sap of that great ash, his only nourishment, Maul had struggled to keep track of the days, the weeks, the months, the years that he had been held against his will. Now, dropping the bag, the sack, that evil satchel at his feet. Maul rubbed his hands together, thick fingers working in vain to wash away the evidence stained on his palms, then sliding down to his wrists, massaging skin rubbed raw, then smooth, then raw and smooth again, by ropes so fine they could only have been woven by elvish hands. The same elvish hands that bound him for a larger share of his life than he cared to dwell upon. The same elvish hands that had nourished him in his youth, and the same elvish hands that stole him away from his birthright, however many years ago his mind spinning from the foreign sensation of freedom, from his roiling anger at what had been taken from him, and most of all, from the magnitude of the heinous act he just saw through to the bitter, bloody end. Maul shook his head sharply, hoping to rattle it all back together, to shake it into place, into some kind of pattern he could make sense of, desperate for solid ground. There, I've brought you what you asked for. He growled it more than he said it, for though this was once a man who stood in his clearing, Maul knew that he had since become something else entirely. He spent years bound to that tree. Years bound to that tree. What else could be expected of a man left in isolation with only beasts as companions, straining against those unbreakable ropes and the mighty branches the elves falsely assumed to be just as unbreakable? That constant struggle for freedom had molded him, had molded Maul into a thing more beast than man, more weapon than beast, a taut ball of muscle set quivering by a potent mix of rage, anticipation, and guilt. This was a man in an older sense of the word, the true sense. A man that had been through the crucible and come out hardened like steel. A man whose body had weathered countless storms and yet become tough like leather. A man who, despite a physical prowess that would be obvious to anyone who laid eyes on him, was in possession of a will left splintered by the savages of imprisonment. For when there's no one to struggle with or against, when the mind is left in isolation, in true isolation, it turns upon itself. And thus Maul, the last scion of a proud line of men whose physical strength was matched only by their will, had been left torn, damaged, racked by mental anguish. He knew the throne was his. He knew the throne was his. He knew that if he could but reach his home realm, he could seize it or else die trying and be embraced by the inky black void of nothingness that is the reward of all men. But the only way to escape the realm of the elves where he had lived for as long as he could remember, was through him and the brutal, merciless sacrifice that he required. In a quick, fluid motion, he stooped low, his gnarled antlers brushing the ground as he snatched up that evil satchel. The suddenness of it had startled Maul, who instinctively reached for the cudgel he wore strapped to his side, its head still stained by gore and chipped by bone, reminders of the grim sacrifice that he had required. Calm yourself. You've brought me my offering, and you've earned my protection. And thus, you have nothing to fear. I fear no man, no elf, no being that draws breath on any of the sundered worlds. He flashed that toothy grin, 
the one that sent shivers down Maul's spine and seemed to live on long after Maul had closed his eyes to block it out. <laughs> I believe you don't, but I am something else entirely, Maul. Whether the insult was intentional or not, Maul bristled at it, and despite the clear danger that came with having the audacity to correct him, he snarled his retort. King Maul. But he just laughed again, giving that same irksome smile as he began to move his hands in subtle but decisive motions. As you wish, my king. Maul, ever suspicious of sorcery, even more so when he depended upon it, did his best to follow the motions of his hands. But like all of his movements, they contained something of the other, something of that dark, riotous underneath. And to stare too closely was to, was to invite it within yourself. Maul watched for as long as he could, terror gnawing at the very narrow marrow of his bones, terror knocking at the base of his skull, and then, shamefully, he looked away, busying himself with the gore that refused to leave his club. As he flicked away a tooth, a link of armor, a bit of bone, he extended his hand, a cold steel goblet balanced in his long, delicate fingers. Drink, he commanded. Though Maul didn't savor his tone, or the fact that he was being commanded at all, he obeyed. What choice did he have? What choice did he have? The worst was done. He had done the worst. And now, all that remained was for Maul to collect his side of the bargain. Safe passage to the world of men, and the power needed to summon his subjects to the near-forgotten banner of his once great tribe. So Maul closed his eyes, and Maul drank. He drank long, and he drank deep. The thick, viscous liquid was shockingly cold, but it burned his stomach, congealing in a tight, flaming core that then moved outwards, traversing the links of his extremities until even the tips of his fingers felt like they were on fire. A weight came crashing down on Maul, the suddenness of it forcing him to step back, to adopt a wider stance, a fighter stance, a fighter stance that came easily to a man of Maul's line. His entire body felt weighted, pulled to the ground. But upon looking down, Maul realized that it wasn't his strength failing him. No, it wasn't even the potion that he had plied him with. It was the gleaming plate armor that now covered him from shining head to shining toe. The rags he had worn through captivity, through binding, through escape and retribution were gone, replaced by a stunning set of plate that shone, not as a reflection of light, but from some inner component of its very being. That armor was both protection and proclamation, announcing itself in the man who wore it as a figure of otherworldly authority. Any man who gazes upon your armor will be as dazzled as you are now, but for some, the feeling won't linger. You'll know what to do with them. What shall it be, my king? The sword? The halberd? A hammer? The axe? Maul shook his head and lifted his cudgel slowly. But before he could speak, he just laughed. <laughs> A club, truly. Not exactly the most regal of armaments. No. Then what shall it be? A two-handed broadsword would... No. Again, he flashed an unnerving, knowing smile. Very well. You have much of your ancestors in you, both good and bad alike. Maul didn't know what he was saying, but something within him understood nonetheless. Enough already. You have your offering, and I my armor. Get on with it. Send me home. If only it were that simple, my king. You see, I can move freely between the realms, but the standard passageways are close to me. My path goes through the underneath. It cuts to the core of all that is known, from whence every realm once sprang forth. To take this path by yourself would, would be to leave you for dead, or else, worse, with a mind more splintered, more shattered than the one you endure even now. No, to take that path, I must escort you. Then do it already! There's nothing left for me here! Send me! And before he could finish his command, the world melted around Maul, with him 
is the only constant. The trees of the forest, the sun in the sky, the dirt on the ground, it all slid away, revealing the precarious network of strings that ties all of reality together. The world was a beautiful curtain, a flaming horror, and a desolate pile of ashes all at once, and Maul's eyes welled up with tears at the sight of it, unable to take in the past, present, and future simultaneously. With madness creeping in, raving nonsense climbing up his throat to his chapped lips, Maul began to shake, knowing and not knowing, feeling and feeling nothing at all, confused, but hopelessly aware of the inevitable when it stopped. Maul's eyes slowly regained focus, and once again he stood before him. Winded, Maul collapsed to his knees, and only then did he realize what they were standing upon. Nothing at all. They flew through a starscape that was blindingly bright, or the starscape flew through them, carrying nothing but sucking darkness. It, it was impossible for Maul to tell. I know this sickens you. It twists your very being, but believe me, I've shielded you from the worst of it. What is it? What is it? It's the truth. The truth that lies behind every facet of every realm, every thought that's ever been spoken, every idea that's ever been had. The truth that only my kind can comprehend. He spoke to Maul in a soothing voice, calming the madness that even now, Maul felt picking away at the edges of his consciousness. As they traveled, he undid that sickening sack and began to rummage in it hungrily, licking the gore off his long, delicate fingers. Though Maul would never want it back, and there was no one else present, at least nothing Maul could detect, he guarded the bag jealously, lovingly caressing each piece of viscera that he carefully selected from that grim, gruesome parcel. Suddenly, he stopped. And once again, that devious smile crept across his lips. But no, it wasn't a smile. He wasn't showing his teeth in appreciation. They were bared in anger. Tips filed to a point and flashing as brightly as the stars surrounding them. You fool. The barriers to keep the madness out began crumbling around Maul's psyche. He had lost his protection. And without it, the underneath, the colossal truth is the foundation of all things, would crush him Utterly, Maul's hand squeezed his temples, trying to force the madness out, but to no avail. No, please, no, please. You fool! You thought to deceive me, the prime deceiver? You were my chosen warrior, my emissary upon the physical planes. I offered you everything. I gave you more than you could accept. And you cheat me? You cheat me of my rightful offering? The sights Maul had seen before them were just pretext, with little more than a dash of the deeper truth in them. What he was confronted with now was was something indescribable, something to blast the mind of beings that exist in as few dimensions as man. I couldn't, I, I couldn't. He grew to an unspeakable size, a grotesque representation of life, taller than a mountain, wider than an ocean, his person surrounding, overwhelming, all-encompassing, and yet, Maul could still see every terrible inch, especially that smile, always that smile, that hateful, sardonic smile. You couldn't go through with your end of the bargain. And why should I be surprised? This, this mercy, this leniency, it is a weakness, a cancer, a deficiency in your blood. The horrors of his actions multiplied and amplified, trumpeting out inside his mind, rattling around his cracking skull. Maul's eyes filled with tears that turned to blood and rotted into pus as they streamed down his face, leaving only decay in their wake. Only one, just the one. He let out an otherworldly roar that seemed to echo within Maul's chest, forcing his heart to stop and his lungs to struggle for breath, all the while the unfettered essence of the underneath tore through his psyche, carving it up for the slavering denizens of that realm that were populating the sides of Maul's vision at an impossible rate. You spared her. Of course you did. It's the same weakness that's always plagued your line, and why you were taken from them so many years ago. Why I allowed you to be taken from them. Struggling for breath, Maul gasped, let me go. He was nothing but that smile, and it whispered, very well. And Maul was let loose in the underneath, the dark truth of everything surrounding him, consuming him, devouring him, simultaneously falling and making impact, falling and making impact, over and over and over again, Maul tumbled through the void. Without the steadying influence of him, his mind was an unmoored ship in the abyss. As Maul fell, he spit hate and he stared bile. He screeched poison and his very thoughts were curved daggers. He stripped Maul of the gleaming armor that had been bestowed upon him. The sign, the proof, the guarantee of his royal heritage and his latent power. You have forsaken my service and you have forsaken my gifts. As Maul fell, cloaked in the rags that had been his only clothing during his bound years, he tossed and he turned, anything to escape that smile. But everywhere he looked, it was waiting for him, glistening, shining, gleaming. Like 
like all of his tribe. Maul, he didn't believe he had a soul, but for a brief moment, he changed his mind as that smile bit deep, deep, deep into his non-existent soul's throat, and it thrashed, refusing to let go. After relieving Maul of his armor, he set his eyes on the one thing he hadn't given Maul. The one thing Maul still had, his cudgel. He saw it and his eyes flashed, unholy mirrors of that debauched smile. Maul clutched it to his chest as he reached out slowly, fingers curving in the shifting light. Those decadent fingers curled around the ancient knotted wood. Those evil fingers digging into the gnarled bark of the weapon and grasping it tightly. But when he pulled, nothing happened. Though he was as big as a god itself, as myriad as the stars in the sky, as powerful as a blazing sun, as persistent as the waves crashing on the rocks, though he exerted every ounce of his considerable powers in this, a world if not of his own making, the surely of his design and of his origin, the cudgel would not budge. For the cudgel was made of sterner stuff than even him. The cudgel had been with Maul for much of his life, the branch to which Maul was bound for more than a decade a seeming eternity spent tied to the mighty ash tree that could not break, that should not shatter, that would not splinter, but did. Maul's mind filled with memories of the moment of his liberation. After years of constant exertion, the sap of the world tree coursing through his veins, struggling day and night and night and day against ropes that were impossibly strong, something had given the branches that he was tied to broke from the world tree's trunk. It was with one of those very branches that he had gone on his gruesome errand. And it was the same one that now clutched to his chest like a man adrift at sea. He looked into Maul's mind as it was his, as was everything else in the coursing underneath. And he saw the truth of the matter. That the underneath was the seed from which the realm sprang forth. The world tree was the source of that seed. So that even now, separated from the tree itself, this simple branch, this mean club, this unassuming cudgel, was the only thing in the underneath that he could not possess, could never possess. Keep your club then, though you'll wish you had a sword to fall on. He screeched, then faded into the underneath, his echoing laughter shattering Maul's eardrums, his tenuous grasp on anything leaking out of his head in the absence of him, who, even in his rage, had given Maul's surroundings a physical form that his mortal brain could at least attempt to comprehend. This was no longer the case. Colors of unnatural hue flashed before Maul's eyes. Purple, but without the pink. Greens, but mostly brown. Yellow that looked like a screech in the night. Maul's head spun, trying to make sense of what he saw before him, because there was no sense to it. The veil of the physical world had been torn away, and all that was left was the terrible underneath, where his power reigned supreme, where nothing was real, and where everything was true. Maul tore at his eyes and plugged up his ears, anything to keep out the madness that surrounded him and seeped in through his very pores. Seeking a focal point but finding no words, Maul gibbered and raved wildly, unable to express the crushing agony of the inexplicable or even give name to the horrors that made his very bones quaver, crack, and crumble. Drowning in air, burnt by frost, his mind blasted by too much knowledge with, with not enough wisdom to parse it, his limbs twisting into unnatural shapes, pulled by forces he couldn't comprehend and in directions he couldn't see. The cudgel is only constant, a simple piece of wood in the rushing current of the underneath, a lone bastion of physical clarity that would not, could not be submerged by the crushing waves of terror that surrounded Maul. Though the cudgel kept his body whole, his mind could not be shielded, and when Maul began to make sense of the underneath, or possibly just lose his mind completely the exact second that the shards of knowing began to knit themselves together into an inconceivable whole the precise moment that his mind split into pieces as numerous as the sundered worlds themselves darkness if you enjoyed what you just heard i hope you'll check me out on social media twitter facebook instagram they're all just aubrey citizen a-u-b-r-e-y-s-i-t-t-e-r-s-o-n no spaces no numbers or you can head over to aubreycitizen.com, spelled the same way. It's got links to everything, including my non scald related projects, credits, bio, as well as contact information. Thanks for listening. I'll talk to you next week.